So how would you like to create high quality virtual tour photos with less effort? What kind of virtual tour equipment do you need? Which camera, which lens, which software? Believe it or not, shooting virtual tours with a DSLR can actually be easier and cost less than you think. And if you already have a DSLR or mirrorless camera, it costs even less for you. Hi, my name is Mick and I've been a photographer since 2007 and I've been shooting in 360 almost exclusively since May of 2015. I've shot virtual tours professionally for both businesses small and large. Now maybe you're a photographer who wants to offer virtual tour services or maybe you're a hobbyist who wants to earn a little bit of side income or maybe you're a real estate agent who wants to offer 3D tours or virtual tours to their clients. In this video, I'm going to show you everything you need to know to shoot 360 photos and virtual tours with a DSLR. By the end of this video, you'll learn these seven things. Number one, why use a DSLR for 360 photos instead of a 360 camera? Number two, which is the best affordable DSLR or mirrorless camera? Number three, which panoramic head should you get? Number four, which lens should you get? Number five, What's the best affordable stitching software? And how do you shoot and stitch with a DSLR? And finally, the answer to a very important riddle that will have big implications for your virtual tour business. See, a couple months ago, I posted this 360 photo on Facebook and they asked why I couldn't have shot this photo with a 360 camera. Now, over 7,000 people saw the photo but less than 20 people had the right idea. And of those 20, less than 10 had the right answer. So what's the answer to this puzzle and what does it have to do with your virtual tour business? Well, stick around and find out. Now these days, it's hard for people to travel or meet people face to face. So virtual tours have never been more popular. This is the best time to get into this business, either full-time or part-time. With the popularity of virtual tours, there are now many new virtual tour photographers getting into this business. Is it too late for you? Well, the good news is that the majority of them use 360 cameras and you can get an advantage by shooting with a DSLR. And I'll show you how to do that. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm not sure I'm ready for this. Isn't shooting 360 photos with a DSLR really technical and expensive? I'm so glad you asked. And you know what? I'm going to make a bet that by the end of this video, you'll know how to shoot with a DSLR. But first, let's find out why should we shoot 360 photos with a DSLR as opposed to a 360 camera? Here are two reasons. Reason number one, suppose you had to prepare a dinner fit for the queen herself. Is it easier to do that with A, canned meat, or B, Kobe beef. Shooting with a 360 camera is definitely cheaper and faster than shooting with a DSLR. But if you want really high quality results, then actually editing a 360 camera photo is actually harder than editing a 360 photo shot with a DSLR. Why? Well, the first reason is that most 360 cameras have tiny sensors. How small are the sensors? Well, see your fingernail and your pinky? Like half the size of that. That's tiny. Well, what about DSLRs? How large are their sensors? Well, they're about the size of the photo on your driver's license. That's a huge difference. And that's why shooting 360 photos with a DSLR is pretty easy once you set it up correctly. And we're gonna learn how to do that in this video. Second reason, client preference. Some clients are actually gonna ask you what kind of camera you shoot with. And if you don't shoot with a full frame camera, some of them will simply write you off. But, but is it too technical? Is it too difficult? Let me give you a preview. Here's the stitching software. I'm loading the images by clicking on load images. Then I click on this button, align images, and that's it. 
Now for some people, clicking on that Align Images button is a little too difficult. But I believe in you. I know you can do it. Now of course, there are many questions I haven't answered. Like which camera did they use? Which lens? Which panoramic head? How much did it all cost? Hang on, we'll talk about all that in this video. Now to shoot a virtual tour photo with the DSLR, we need four things. Number one, a camera. Number two, the lens. Three, the panoramic head. And four, the stitching software. The question is, which one? So first, which is the best affordable DSLR or mirrorless for a 360 photo? Well, that begs the question, what is the difference between a DSLR and a mirrorless camera? Time for an experiment. This is the Fuji S5 Pro. Shows how old I am. See that inside there? Let me show you. You see that? You know what that is? That is not the sensor. That is a mirror. What's a mirror doing in a camera? Well, let me show you. See this light on my phone? I'm gonna shine it through the viewfinder and watch what happens. See that? That's because that mirror is kind of like an upside down periscope. It lets the photographer see from behind the lens. And that's the whole point of a DSLR. Now let's take a look at a mirrorless camera. This is the Sony A6000, one of my favorite cameras. I got it when it was first released. So let's take a look inside. You see that? That is the sensor. Who knew a mirrorless camera doesn't have a mirror? Instead of a mirror, a mirrorless camera just shows you a live video feed from the sensor itself. All right, that's interesting, but what does that have to do with me? How does this help me choose a camera for my virtual tour? Hold on, I got you. See, the big difference is the viewfinder. On the DSLR, what we see in the viewfinder is kind of like a reflection from behind the lens. Whereas with the mirrorless camera, the viewfinder is not a reflection, it's more like a mini monitor. So if a DSLR's viewfinder is like a peephole in a door, the viewfinder on a mirrorless camera is like, like a closed circuit TV. And that means you get all sorts of information. You can see the histogram, exposure information, you can zoom in, you can change the, the colors, you can do anything. Now the second difference between them is this. This is thin, this is fat, like me. A mirrorless camera doesn't use a mirror, so it doesn't need all that space. So the lens can be much closer to the sensor. There's a term for that, it's called flange distance. And here's the key. A camera with a short flange distance can use a lens for a camera with a long flange distance. But a camera with a long flange distance cannot use a lens that was designed for a camera with a short flange distance. So in other words, mirrorless cameras can use DSLR lenses, but DSLRs cannot use mirrorless lenses as a general rule. Now to be fair, DSLRs do have some advantages over mirrorless cameras. For example, they have a longer battery life. But remember, when we're shooting with virtual tours, we're usually shooting in controlled conditions. So if you run out of battery, well, easily swap it out. Wedding photographers might not have that luxury, but virtual tour photographers, we got this. So that's why for virtual tours, I would recommend a mirrorless camera instead of a DSLR. But a DSLR is also okay. Next question, sensor size, does it matter? You got full frame, APS-C, micro four thirds, which one should you get? As a general rule, the larger the sensor, the better the image quality. But again, remember that we're shooting in controlled conditions. When you're shooting with virtual tours, your camera is gonna be on a tripod. You can shoot with a base ISO with a long shutter speed if you need to. And that's why even a smaller sensor like APS-C or micro four thirds can have similar quality as a full frame camera. Having said that, 
full frame cameras do have a couple advantages that you need to be aware of. Number one is resolution. In 2021, micro four thirds sensors max out at around 20 megapixels. For APS-C, the highest resolution right now is around 32 megapixels. Now for full frame, the highest resolution in 2021 so far is 60 megapixels. So if you want higher resolution, the way to do it is to use a larger sensor. And next advantage of full frame sensors is lens choice. If we're talking about lenses designed specifically for your camera sensor size, full frame sensors have the widest array of choices. APS-C size sensors have fewer choices and micro four thirds sensors have still less. And the third advantage of full frame cameras client preference. Again, some clients will ask you what you shoot with and if you don't use full frame, then they might write you off. So to summarize, which is the best affordable DSLR or mirrorless camera for 360 photos? I would recommend the Sony A7R series or for APS-C, the Sony A6000 series. Now, before you go jumping on eBay, I want you to be aware of what you might be giving up. So stick around to the end of this video. All right, next, which panel head should you get? Well, there are two main types. One is a single row, one is multi-row. What's the difference? Let's find out. All right, so here's a single row panel head. You can see that there's a lens ring right here and it's attached to the panoramic head. To take a shot, we simply rotate it. There's only one axis. It just rotates around like this. So we take one shot here, another shot there, another shot there, another shot there, four shots. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is a multi-row panoramic head. In addition to being able to turn horizontally, a multi-row panoramic head can also rotate the camera vertically like that, pointing it downward, all the while keeping the lens at a very special position called the nodal point. And we're gonna find out about that later on. All right, so which one should you get? Should you get a single row panoramic head or a multi-row panel head? Well, it's all about your priorities. On one hand, you can have speed and convenience or you can have versatility and higher resolution. So a single row panel head is much faster to shoot with while a multi-row panel head can use many different lenses and can have higher resolution, but it does take a little bit longer to shoot with it. All right, so which panoramic head would I recommend if you could only buy one type? Well, here's the thing. I've never had anyone demand that I shoot with a single row panel head, but I have had clients who have requested multi-row panel heads. So although it's really convenient to shoot with a single row, I'd have to recommend multi-row. Which multi-row? Well, this one is the Nodal Ninja 6. I'm a big fan of Nodal Ninja products. But if you're on a tight budget, you can go with this one. This is from newer and it's way more affordable and it does the job. Now let's go to the next question. Which lens should you get? Well, as I mentioned, multi-row panoramic heads can use lenses of almost any type. But for virtual tours, most people shoot with fisheye lenses as opposed to rectilinear lenses. But wait, won't fisheye lenses cause distortion? And the answer is no. When you're shooting in 360, there will be no fisheye distortion in your final shot. Or you can add it if you want to. It all depends on your 360 projection, not your lens. Now there are three types of fisheye lenses. First is circular. That means it's 180 degrees both vertically and horizontally. Next is cropped fisheye, which means it's 180 degrees vertically, but not horizontally. Then there's diagonal, which means it's 180 degrees diagonally, but not vertically or horizontally. If you're shooting with a single row panoramic head, then you should choose a circular or cropped fisheye as a general rule. And between the two, a cropped fisheye will result in a higher resolution. If you're shooting with a multi-row panoramic head, you can use any type of fisheye lens, but a diagonal fisheye lens will result in a higher resolution. Now, are fisheye lenses expensive? There's one for almost any budget. 
For full frame single roll, you can go with a Samyang 8mm f3.5, it's very popular. Make sure to get the one with the removable hood. There's an older version that, where the hood cannot be removed and you cannot use that for a single roll. For full frame diagonal fisheye, you can go with the Samyang 12 2.8, also very popular. Now how about APS-C? For APS-C multi-roll, you can use the Samyang 8mm f3.5. For APS-C single roll, there aren't many choices, uh, but the most popular one is Sigma 8mm f3.5. All right, we got all the gear we need, but it won't work until we have stitching software. That's the next topic. Now, I would strongly recommend getting PT GUI, at least the standard version, which is around $150. But if you're on a very tight budget, you can also get Panorama Studio 3 Pro. Now, the difference between them is that PT GUI will have many time-saving features. For example, PT GUI can merge HDR and stitch your photos at the same time. Now let's learn how to shoot and stitch a 360 photo with the DSLR, both multi-row and single row. All right, so in the next couple of minutes, we're gonna learn how to shoot with a single row panoramic head and a multi-row panoramic head. So to do this, we're gonna need a few things. We're gonna need your camera, your lens, your panoramic head, and either one or two light stands if possible. Uh, so first let's learn how to shoot with a multi-roll panoramic head. So here's, here's a multi-roll panoramic head. This is the newer uh, pano head and I've got a Sony A6000 and a Samyang 8mm 2.8 on it. So step one is to adjust the horizontal alignment. That's this one. So if we loosen this knob, you can see that it can slide back and forth. We need to make sure that the camera is centered over this. How do we do that? Well, it's easy. All we need to do is raise this, point the camera all the way downward like that. Adjust it so that this is in the middle of that frame. So I'm going to loosen the knob and move it there like that. Okay, if your camera has a, a magnification function, like focus magnification, you can do that. So here it looks like it's in the middle. So okay, now this is aligned. Next, you'll see that the camera can move along this axis. So what we need to do is adjust it to the correct point, the nodal point. I'll show you how to do that. So to do that, we're going to need two tall, thin objects, such as two light stands, or if you only have one light stand, that can, you can look for any other tall, thin object. Uh, for example, there, like, like that crack on the wall. So we're going to aim the camera toward the two targets. We're going to align the first target here. This is the light stand. The second target is going to be that crack on the wall. And I'm going to uh, aim them. So I'm going to put my camera so that it's aimed at them. So, okay, so here. And as before, we can use our focus magnification. So I'm using focus magnification. And you can see that the light stand is aligned with that crack on the wall. So with the light stand and the crack aligned, what we're going to do is we're going to turn the camera all the way until it reaches the edge of the lens, like there. So with the camera at the edge of the lens, we're going to inspect it again. Use focus magnification again. This time I'm going to move it there. Zoom in. So now you see that the light stand and the crack are no longer aligned. Like the, the light stand is a little bit to the right of the crack. So what we're going to do is we're going to adjust the rail. I'm going to adjust it here. I'm going to loosen this. I'm going to adjust it forward or backward until they're aligned again. So here looks like they're aligned again. So I'm going to tighten it. Then we're going to exit focus magnification and we're going to this time we're going to move the camera all the way here where the light stand is on the left side of the frame and we're going to do the same thing we're going to uh, use focus magnification to see if the light stand is still aligned with that crack so I'm going to bring my focus magnification there bring in here and looks like they're pretty much aligned they're a little bit misaligned loosen this so we move it back and forth okay like around there And that's it. We're going to go 
we're gonna go move it backward again and that's kind of like the basic process we move back and forth and slide it each time moving making sure that the light stand is aligned with the distant target in this case that crack and once you find that point then that's it you've found the no parallax points so here for example so the light stand is aligned with the crack The light stand is again aligned with the crack so that means that we have found the no parallax point all right so now that we've found the no parallax point we're ready to shoot with the multi-row panoramic head so all i'm going to do is uh, set my exposure to normal and then i'm going to so i'm going to adjust my exposure okay then i'm going to aim the camera that way and i'm going to shoot then i'm going to turn the camera uh, 60 degrees to be safe you could also do 90 degrees sometimes one so so just 60 degrees all right so we've shot six shots all around and I'm gonna aim the camera upward and when I shoot upward I'm going to duck below the lens so that I'm not gonna be seen then we're going to aim the camera downward. We're going, to sh we're going to shoot. Then we're going to take another one, 90 degrees apart. And that's it. We've shot a, our first 360 panorama with a multi row panoramic head. Now let's do it with a single row panoramic head, and you'll see a lot of similarities. All right, so I've got a single row panoramic head here. I've attached the lens ring to my um, lens here, and then I'm going to attach it to my uh, panoramic head here. Okay. So unlike a multi-row panoramic head, you don't need to look for the horizontal alignment. We're only looking for one alignment, this one. We're just looking for this. Once more, we have a light stand. We have a distant target. Then we're going to aim the two here on our camera <coughs> so we can see that the light stand and that uh, space between the wall are aligned so okay so now I'm going to turn the uh, we're going to turn the panoramic head this way all the way to one edge and we're going to take a look at the alignment here using the focus alignment it looks like it's pretty much aligned so I mean, if it were not, then I would move it backward and forward until they were aligned. So we're going to do the same thing here on the other side. So we're going to turn the camera all the way here. So well, the light stand is at the edge of the lens. We're going to inspect it to see if the light stand and the space are aligned. And it looks like they are aligned. So that's it. We have found the no parallax point for this lens. So now that we've found the no parallax point, we're ready to shoot. So to shoot the, with a single roll, we're going to take four shots horizontally. So we're going to, I'm going to ready to shoot this way. I'm going to turn it 90 degrees. Another 90 degrees. And that's it. All right, so here's how to stitch them. I mean, I've launched PT GUI Pro. I'm going to click on Load Images, and I'm going to select the images. In this case, PT GUI Pro can actually merge in uh, the HDR and stitch them at the same time. So this is one set of those photos over here. So we're then we're going to click on Open. Then we're going to click on Enable HDR Mode. Then we're going to click on OK to merge them. And you can see. PT GUI merge them automatically. Then we click on this focal length here and select the focal length of the lens that we use, which is the Sigma. So we click type 8 and then look for the Sigma and then clicked on OK. Then we clicked on Align Images. It's done. I'm going to minimize this, click Create Panorama and Create Panorama. And that's it, we're done. All right, so now you know how to shoot a 360 photo with the DSLR, but there's a little bit of bad news. If I showed you a 360 photo from a DSLR, 
versus a 360 photo shot with a 360 camera, I bet you could probably pick out the difference. You would notice that the DSLR photo has more detail and better dynamic range. But the thing is, most of your clients are not going to be photographers. So for them, the difference between a 360 photo and a DSLR might not be as large as you might first think. Wait a minute, Did, didn't you tell me that shooting a DSLR would give me an advantage? Yes, it can, but you have to use it the right way. Alright, so how do you really stand out from your competition? Well, we have to go back to the purpose of virtual tours. At their core, the primary purpose of virtual tours is to sell something. Maybe it's to sell a house or a book a hotel room or get more patients for a nursing facility. At the end of the day, we're selling something with our virtual tours. So how can we use virtual tours to sell better? Well, remember that riddle I told you about at the beginning of this video? Again, I showed this photo to thousands of people and they asked why a 360 camera couldn't have shot this photo. And most people didn't know the answer. So let me tell you and how it can help you with your virtual tour business. So here is the photo that you and thousands of people saw. What you did not see is how the scene actually looked like. This is how it was. There were no lights. Why? Because I shot it in the afternoon. It was too bright for them to turn on the display lights. And yet, you will see lights just not from the lights that they had. Now here's another example. Here's what you saw, and here's what it really looked like. There were no lights. And one more example, and here's what it really looked like. There were lights, but they were too weak to illuminate anything. So going back to the problem of selling, let's say you were booking a hotel room. Which room would you prefer? This or this? Now let's say where you were shopping for glasses, which optometry shop would you prefer? This or this? The answer is pretty clear. If you're a property manager, you'd be pretty crazy not to choose the one with better lighting. Now the question is, how was it done? And the answer is, drum roll please, flash. Wait, flash? Are you, are you serious? Like flash looks terrible. And yes, you are half right. Flash does look terrible if it is not used correctly. And here's the key, here's the key. This is really important. If flash is used correctly, it should look invisible. Why? Because if it is used correctly, it should look so natural that you wouldn't even know that flash was used. It's kind of like CGI at the movies. If it's really well done, you wouldn't even know that they used CGI. You'd think it was real. Now using flash is its own specialty in photography. And the reality is that very few 360 photographers know how to use flash. Now I've been using flash since 2006. And I'm passionate about it. And it's just one of the topics that I cover in Virtual Tour Edge 2.0. Really quickly, here are 14 things you learn in Virtual Tour Edge 2.0. First, a crash course in flash photography. I'll show you how to use flash to transform your 360 photos even if you've never shot with flash before. Second, what I call the architectural lighting style. Ever seen those real estate photos in magazines? Why do they look somehow different from your photos? Well, here's the answer because they probably used flash and you'll learn how to use it to get that magazine look. Third, what I call the signature look. You've already seen samples of it and you can see how much drama it adds to a scene. This will help your photos stand out. Next, 
a very unusual yet effective technique for impressing your clients. It works every time. Now one time, the client was so happy that they gave me a big tip, like 25%. Five, how to get higher quality lenses at a lower cost. Imagine this, you can get a $400 lens that has a higher resolution than the Canon 8-15 or the Nikon 8-15. That's a $1,250 lens. Want to shoot gigapixel photos automatically? Well, you might have heard of Roundshot VR. It's a motorized pan head that does this, but it costs $4,700. Well, in VTE2, you'll learn how to use an affordable motorized pan head, the Nodal Ninja Mecha series, both the single axis and dual axis. Next, how to get much higher resolution without taking more shots. Learn how to do pole photography and be able to take 360 photos from as high as 30 feet. Next, little known accessories that will save your butt. They saved mine many times. And if you don't have these accessories, oh. Next, a camera and lens calculator. Do you have gear acquisition syndrome? Well, with this calculator, you can see if it's really worth getting a new camera or a new lens. You'll see what resolution you're gonna get. And if you have a target resolution in mind, like let's say a gigapixel resolution, you'll know what kind of lens you'll need to be able to get that resolution that you want. Find out which cameras will give you a much smoother workflow and will save you tons of time. Learn advanced techniques for a more precise no parallax point. Learn the right way to patch the nadir with no holes no matter how complex the nadir. Fix stitching errors instantly with no guessing involved. Now, I already have 7 hours of videos uploaded and by the end of this month, there will be 8 hours of videos there. And plus, there will be even more techniques added at no additional cost. In addition, you'll get exclusive discounts worth literally hundreds of dollars. And you'll get mentoring in a private group. Okay, so the big question is, how much does it cost? Now, if you're new to virtual tours, you might be wondering how much can you earn? Now, this depends a lot on where you are, but for California, you can earn $1,000 a day or more, realistically. Now, of course, you're not gonna get a new project every single day, but if you could get one per month, how much would that be worth? Now, if I told you about an investment where you could get back your money in just one month and the rest would be profit, that would be pretty good, wouldn't it? But it's even better because this course is not $1,000 or $500, but just $249. At that price, even just the savings that you'll get will pay for itself. But I'm going to make it even better because you watch this video all the way. I'm going to send you a special discount of 20%. All you need to do is sign up with this link. And I'll make it even better still. During the launch period, if you get VTE2, you can also get VTE HQ method for free. That's a course with special techniques for 360 cameras. And by itself, that's $200. And here's what people have said about it. Okay, so what's the catch? Well, there are three things. Number one, you do need a PC or Mac. You cannot use your phone or tablet. Two, you will need some software. So we've already talked about PT GUI. You'll also need Lightroom and either Photoshop or Affinity. And finally, you'll need an HDR software that costs around $100. And third, there is a confidentiality agreement. All right, so is there a guarantee? Yes, I do have a guarantee. Not 14 days or 30 days, but 60 days. If you follow the instructions and you don't get the results, just let me know and I'll help you through them. And if I cannot help you, I'll give you your money back 100%. Again, this is a very unique time in our lives. And if you're ready to use this special time as an opportunity for you and your family, and you're ready to start your virtual tour business, then I'll see you in 360.